It was a kind of evening more easily felt than described. Darkness had come right up against the window panes of the billiards club, pressing upon them like a great cat, and a bleak wind running down the street from the east was uttering little cries. We'd all moved away from that end of the room in which the window was, and were gathered close to the fire. Even the shadows that lurked in the darker parts of the room seemed aware of the neighbouring night. The faces of the waiters were grave. It was a ghostly evening. How bald are those words to tell of what we all felt unmistakably running along our veins and touching our very skins. And if such feelings are hard to describe, it is harder still to account for them. And I will make no such attempt, merely recording that one of our members said suddenly, Somebody tell us a ghost story. And in saying that, he expressed the mood of all of us. So ghostly the evening was, that I think it occurred to all of us that it might be nice to have the whole eerie subject turn from the fact of the ghostliness all about us to mere fiction further away. But there's no analysing such feelings. Anyway, Jorkins replied, I can tell you a story, he said, of a personal experience, and you can put your own interpretation on it. And I thought I caught a sidelong glance that he may have made towards Turbot, as though to assure himself that Turbot was listening, as he usually is when Jorkins tells a story, never having, I think, entirely given up hope of catching out Jorkins definitely one day, perhaps in revenge for a bet or two that he's lost to him. One can't really explain those things, said Turbot. You shall try, said Jorkins. And then he told us this story. It was a night colder than this, and I was out in it. It was so cold that, besides a muffler, I had put on a good old dressing gown, and, of course, an overcoat over that for additional warmth, and also, as I need hardly say, because you can't go about out of doors in a visible dressing gown. I was going down to a village close to my house, because I really felt that a little warmth was absolutely required, and with the amount of coal that's being supplied to us now, and the quality of it, I was not getting warmth enough. I felt something more was required, and there was a pub in our village that had it, so that's where I was going, if you want to know, Turbot. Turbot disclaimed any objection, and Jorkins continued. I had just been reading some weird tales, Edgar Allan Poe, as a matter of fact, and if it had not been for that, I doubt if my sensitiveness would have been so attuned to what happened as to have perceived it at once, as I did. And I've often noticed, and tested it on many occasions, that whatever increases one's sensitiveness makes all one's senses acuter at the same time, especially the sense of hearing so that as soon as I got on the road I perceived quite unmistakably that a suspicion that I'd had in my little drive was nothing less than a fact, and that I was being followed. Closely followed, too. But near as the thing was, the soft pit-pat of its footfall was so very soft indeed that, had I not been attuned to such things, as I said, I might never have known that I was being pursued. I did not look round at once, one does not like to on such occasions, too afraid of what one may see, but it was so very close that I knew that I had to. So round I glanced over my shoulder into the clammy, dank night, and it was too dark to see anything, so then I hurried on, and the thing hurried too. I didn't look round any more till after I left that road. Indeed, though I'd seen nothing, I realised to the full of the meaning of those lines of Coleridge, as one who walks a lonely road in terror and in dread, and having once looked round goes on, and turns no more his head, because he knows some frightful fiend doth close behind him tread. Suddenly I stopped short. So did the thing behind me. They always do. Of course, whatever is following you is not likely to go on with its walk just because you've stopped. So there we stood for a moment in dead silence and no sound of breathing, except my own. Then I went on again, so did the thing behind me. It was a lonely road in a late hour. A motor might have solved the problem with its bright acetylene lights, but no motor came. There was a railway, though, not far off, and through the dark and the loneliness an electric train went by. That gave me an idea. I'd been working pretty hard at ideas all the time, but that gave me another. 
Knowing the railway was there, I had had the idea of walking down the track and hoping that the thing, whatever it was, would get run over. But the trouble about that was, if a train were to run over anything that was following me, as close as that was, it would run over me too. And then the electric train went by, banishing for a moment the loneliness and even a bit of the darkness. And I saw the glow that went up from the showers of sparks that an electric train draws out of the live rail. And that gave me my better idea. It was neither easy nor safe. And I wasn't just then in the mood to be deterred by any difficulty. And as for danger, the only one that my fears could trouble about was that faint but awful footfall so very close in the night. Sometimes it was a mere rustling. My idea was to go to the railway and walk along it within a few inches of the live rail. Then if the thing, whatever it was, did not stray onto it, I would step across the rail and see what happened to my pursuer then. I knew that nothing living could survive that. And for the rest, we know too little of spirits or electricity to be able to say what effect one of them may be able to have on the other. It could only be a matter of experiment, and this experiment I decided to make. I turned from the road into a weedy lane that ran towards the railway, and the pit-pat of the horror that followed me turned at once to a shuffling. But it was as faint as the footfall. You must not imagine that there was anything terrible in the sound itself, for it was the merest whisper. It was only the fact that it indicated that an unknown presence was close to me that made the faint footfall so terrible. Close and pursuing, and the faintness of the sound of it seemed to suggest that it was no bodily thing at all. That and its total invisibility made me fear some such thing, though the darkness of this dank night may have accounted for its invisibility. Certainly I was not invisible, or it would not have been following me, unless it followed by smell or by some sense of which we know nothing. And then it occurred to me that perhaps after all the night made me nearly invisible, and that was why it followed me so close. In giving you these few fancies, I don't suppose I've told you more of my anxious thoughts than what occupied two yards of that dreadful walk, down the little lane, deserted by every little thing but myself, and what followed me, if indeed it had life, I came to the iron gate of a level crossing. I opened it, and it closed with a clang in the lonely night. Then we were on the railway. I turned at once to my left, and, luckily, the dampness of the night, that added so much to the darkness everywhere else, had made the rails shine, so that by stooping somewhat I could see where the live rail ran. There would be no more trains on the down line for some while, so it was on that line by the side of which I was now walking that the train had just gone. Still the pit-pat behind me, clearer now on the flints among the rails. I was walking very close to the live rail, but the thing that followed followed me so exactly that it made no step to the left and came to no harm. I steeled myself to look round again, and I looked Still I saw nothing, and not only did I see nothing, but I saw the gleam of the rail so close behind me that I knew no bodily form could be erect between me and them. It was therefore something small, or something crouching, or some dark spirit that had no bodily form. Again I hoped that a force of which I was ignorant, a strong electric current, might have some power over a thing of which I was equally ignorant. How could I tell? And if, after all, it was of the animal world, I knew it would not survive that electric rail. But how to get it onto the rail? And then the idea came to me to step across the live rail, and it seemed to me that the thing that followed so closely would then be bound to touch it. And if not, I meant to step back over it again and go on till it did. Risky, of course, but a risk of which one knew, which was nothing compared with the terror of unknown, hellish things. So I stepped over the live rail with that pit-a-pat sounding behind me. And as it turned out, the very first step did it. For a smell of sudden burning blew on the wind from behind me, and the sounds of pursuit stopped. Then I got away from the railway and the live rail as quick as I could, and came to the road again, and went down it pursued no more. And in a very few minutes I came to the pub, where there happened to be a lot of jolly fellows, simple no doubt, but more generous and hospitable than anyone you'd ever find in town, 
or at any rate in a town like this, and one or two of them saw that I needed a drink, for they have very quick intuitions down in the country, and indeed they were right. Oh well, said Turbot, I suppose it's not very hard to tell, and he ordered a whisky for Jorkins. Thank you, said Jorkins. But you haven't told us, said Turbot, what was following you. That, said Jorkins, as I said just now, I will leave to you to explain. And try to explain it we did, while Jorkins sipped Turbot's whisky, and soon we divided into two schools of thought, one urging that whatever was following Jorkins must have been animal, because not, nothing without substance could have been consumed by fire, and the other holding that our knowledge, either of electricity or of spirits, was not yet so far advanced that we could say for certain how one could affect the other, or why it could not. Therefore, they said that Jorkins' pursuer might have been something that could even have ridden to the very place at which Jorkins heard it upon a current of electricity, and that by another electric current it may have been blasted hence, who can say where, any more than we can say, under similar circumstances, what may become of any of us. And the argument heaved up and down on its course from combustibility of earthly things all the way to eternal fires, till Turbot, taking it upon himself, perhaps on account of some legal knowledge he may have acquired, to sum up, or to give his judgment, pronounced that in his opinion the phenomenon was due to the imagination of Jorkins, stimulated, no doubt, by grim books and a dark night. No, said Jorkins, it wasn't imagination, and that I am able to prove. Prove? said Turbot. How can you prove it? Because, said Jorkins, when I got home, and took off the dressing gown that I told you I was wearing under my coat, I found that one of the tassels of the kind of rope that dressing gowns always have, and which must have been trailing behind me, was entirely burned off. 